Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Graceology with Gwen Smith podcast. I'm Gwen Smith, and I'm so glad you've joined me today. Around here, we have fun, faith-focused, grace-filled conversations, all to help you know and trust God more. Our discussions are honest, often humorous, and always practical. And they're going to encourage you in meaningful ways to live out and lean on the grace of Jesus in the midst of cluttered, messy days. You got any of those? I know I do, and I can't wait to get to this episode. Today, my guest is Michigan native and popular Bible teacher, Karen Eman. Karen is the author of 14 books, including her New York Times bestseller, Keep It Shut. She is a speaker with Proverbs 31 Ministries and also a writer for Encouragement for Today, the P31 online devotions that reach more than 4 million women daily. Karen and I have a candid conversation about marriage today, which is the subject of her newest book, Keep Showing Up, How to Be Crazy in Love When Your Love Drives You Crazy. Is that not the best subtitle you've ever heard? (laughs) Man, I'm telling you, marriage is hard, especially in a culture that doesn't always value or support marriage. When times get rough and personalities clash as they're bound to in any relationship, Karen wants to encourage women that marriage is worth the work and it is not time to throw in the towel. So if you ever struggle showing love to your spouse or deal with intense personality conflicts, or even if you've felt it at times like you may have married the wrong person, you're going to love this Graceology episode. It's full of biblical discussion and relatable stories and practical suggestions that will help deepen your understanding of God's grace and his purposes for marriage. Karen, welcome to the Graceology Podcast. Hey, Gwen. Thanks so much for having me. Absolutely. We've been friends for a long time now, so this is fun to have you on the other side of the microphone. Yeah, I know. I was thinking about that today. Like, I don't even want to add up how long we've known each other because it makes me feel feel old, so I'm not going to do it. (laughs) Yeah, I'm kind of with you on that. (laughs) My husband said this morning, what did he say, Brad said? He said, getting old, it's it's a little bit sad. And I was like, well, at least we have each other. (laughs) That's all right. So one of the things that we do around here is we have a different way to get to know our guests by doing a fast fun favorites round. Okay. So (laughs) Karen, are you game? It sounds fun and fast. We'll see if it's one of my favorites. Let's let's go. Let's do it. <laughs> okay. So here we go. Karen, giving presents or getting presents? Giving for sure. Cool. Who was your favorite character on the show, Charlie's Angels? Oh, Farah. I had to have her hair. Come on. <laughs> Terrific. I, try, I tried to have her hair. It didn't work. But... It didn't work for me, but yeah. <laughs> okay. On a plane, do you wear a neck pillow? Yes. Okay. On a scale of one to 10, how good are you at ping pong? Two. (laughs) What size bed do you prefer? King and sleep alone, kick my snoring husband to the guest room. (laughs) Then then I get a good night's sleep. (laughs) I sleep diagonally. I like just sprawl everywhere. My daughter does that. It's hilarious. (laughs) Okay. Name one thing on your bucket list. Hmm, To meet my aunt in California. My dad's last living sibling, whom I just connected with the week before he died. Oh, that's a good one. Okay. Where were you born? Lansing, Michigan, in the middle of a snowstorm. (laughs) And we're in the middle of a snowstorm right now while we're recording this. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Mm-hmm. All right. Neat or messy? Neat. Would you rather be able to speak every language or talk to the animals? Speak every language. Same. What is your favorite makeup item? My fancy pants, two-step eyebrow liner paste stuff my cosmetology daughter gave me because now I actually look like I have eyebrows. <laughs> it was never a thing until like five years ago. And then I know. All, all of a sudden, we have to have our eyebrows like Brooke Shields in the 70s. I mean, come I on. Know. Maybe early 80s. When was Blue Lagoon? Yeah, probably early 80s. Yeah, I think so. Okay, fill in the blank. Justin Bieber is? Hmm... A a mystery a little bit. (laughs) Okay. At what age do you want to retire? Never. Okay. Good. Same me. And then the last 
question is, what is your favorite junk food? Hmm. Fritos scoops dipped in Kroger brand chip dip. Oh, you're speaking my language. Fritos are my favorite. <laughs> See, that was that was fun. That was harmless. And I feel like I know you so much more now. Yeah. And the next time we're together, you know what we're going to be eating. We're going to have some Fritos, <laughs> definitely with dip. I'm all about the chips and dip, girl. <laughs> Guys, today's episode of the Graceology with Gwen Smith podcast is sponsored by my absolute favorite seasonal subscription box, FabFitFun. Listen, you can receive 20% off your first box when you go to FabFitFun.com and use the code Graceology. So if you don't already know about it, it's a seasonal box with full-size beauty, fitness, and lifestyle products. Their winter editor's box was amazing, so I'm super stoked to get my spring box, which I believe is going to be epic. It always is. (laughs) Do not miss it because they sell out fast. Be sure to check out FabFitFun.com and then use the code Graceology so that you can save $10 off your first box, which makes it only $39.99. Again, that's FabFitFun.com and use the code Graceology to save 20% off your first box. So I am I'm, I'm excited to, to have my Graceology community get to know you. You've got a cool new book out. But before we get into the book, I just want us to learn a little bit more about you. So tell us about you. Where did you grow up? How did you meet Todd? Okay. I grew up in mid Michigan. We are the mitten, you know, the mitten state. I I like to think of us as America's high five. That's what (laughs) Michigan is. And so I grew up in mid Michigan, lived there my whole life and then went away to a little tiny college in Southern Michigan where I met my husband who is also from Michigan, but he's from the West coast of Michigan. See, we have a West Coast, too. But don't I sound like all Californian when I say that? But anyway. <laughs> totally. <laughs> he grew up on uh, the shores of Lake Michigan, just across the lake from Chicago. So kind of the last exit to get out of Michigan on your way to Chicago. We yes. met at college in the dining commons. And I talked to him as he sat across from me. My best friend was with me. She was still in high school. But we talked that day. I went back to my dorm room and wrote down in my Bible that I met the man I'm going to marry. No. And he didn't give me the time of day for about two years. But he eventually <laughs> came around. He eventually saw that I was right. Oh, my goodness. Were you a freshman? I was a sophomore and he just had transferred in as a sophomore. Karen, Brad and I met in college in the cafeteria. And I He had literally just transferred in from another school. No. Yes, I'm totally serious. Were they serving Fritos? Then then that's going to be really free. Okay, no, here's what I had every day for lunch my freshman year. This is so embarrassing. I had chicken fingers and French fries. It's so bad. Oh, yeah. It makes me sick to think about. In fact, I just told Kennedy, uh, my daughter, about that when we were at a volleyball tournament last weekend. I was like, you see those chicken fingers and French fries? That's what I had almost every single day growing up or in college. And she was like, Mom. And I'm like, I know, because I'm so healthy now, except for my Frito obsession. But, you know, besides that. So that's so cool. So he didn't give you the time of day for two years. How did that play out? Well, he he was new to the faith. He had just become a Christian and he, this was a Christian college and he just really is one of these guys that can focus on one thing at a time. And he just really wanted to focus on his studies. He was taking philosophy, religion as his major. He wanted to be a pastor and that's all he could really handle was like learning about God and doing his classes. He has dyslexia quite severely. And so his classes came very hard to him. And so he just told himself, like, I'm not going to have a relationship. I'm just going to focus on college. And that's what he did and tried to do. We were good friends, but he just was not going to go there as far as being in a relationship or calling me his girlfriend. And until a very wise mentor of mine said, make yourself scarce, go on a date with someone else. And I just took one date with some other guy and he came running to me and said, no, no, will you be my girlfriend? I can can do this. I can do this. Well played, Karen. Well played. There you go. (laughs) So did he go on to be a pastor? He was. He was a youth pastor for almost a decade when we were first married. And then as our 
kids were, while well, we were on, I think, having number three and just in that busy stage of parenting, again, he knew he could really only focus on one thing well. And he was an excellent youth pastor. He was so involved in the kids' lives. We were at all of their events and ball games and all of that. And then now he had his own children and he kind of felt like his loyalties were divided. So he left the ministry to go just work a secular job, thought he'd do it for about six months to a year and then get back in the ministry, maybe doing like family ministry or something. But he works at a factory making automobiles in Michigan. And we like to think of it as he's doing a work among an unreached people's groups because he starts Bible studies in the factory and he's actually still got a ministry But he now has a very stable, secular job where he doesn't bring his work home with him. And so it's it's actually been a really good blend. That's totally cool. And I love it because honestly, it's ministry that we're all called to. And, you know, I kind of use the word ministry in air quotes because it's so important for every single one of us to realize that we don't have to be in quote unquote full time ministry to be in ministry. That's what we're all called to do. And I love that he's doing it in a in a car factory. Mm hmm. Yeah, that's cool. All right. So I want to talk about this new book, which does include Todd, uh, but it cause, it's called Keep Showing Up. And it's a book that is about marriage. And I love the subtitle. It's How to Stay Crazy in Love When Your Love Drives You Crazy. <laughs> that is so fun. OK, how did you come up with that title? Well, you know, the the original title I was going to have or subtitle, I should say, was how the marriage you've always wanted can be the one you already have. Because yeah. that's really a lot what the book's about. But it sounded so lofty and syrupy. And <laughs> I thought that's not how I write. You know, I'm, I'm pretty keep it real girl. I, I like to use humor because that's just kind of how I am. Yeah. But also, you know, drive home some hard biblical truths we all need to apply in our lives. And so I thought, you know, this book really is about the things that drive you nuts about your spouse and that drive you crazy. But instead of letting them drive you crazy, let them drive you straight to Jesus. And so I kind of played with that for a little while. And then I I think just through trial and error with me and a Ticonderoga number two pencil and a legal pad, which is how I like to think (laughs) I came up with this one. And um, we we test drove it with a community I have where I kind of throw out some titles and ideas and see what they like. And I gave them both the subtitle I mentioned a minute ago and then this one. And overwhelmingly people like this one. So that's why that. I, it's totally there. It's amazing. I, I love that I, because it's just a picture of reality because as much as we love our men and our people, my word, they can drive us nuts. Mm hmm. Yeah. And we do, and we drive them nuts. Oh, well. definitely. <laughs> I, absolutely. You kind of scared me a little bit in our fast fun favorites around because you said you're neat. And then you said Todd can only handle to focus on one thing at a time. I'm like, oh, wow, this is a very structured, orderly home. Am I getting the right picture there? Well, yes. And he is neater than he is neater than I am. No. But this is so, so this is the thing. We are both pretty particular about our stuff but not so much about our schedule and our relationships. Like we're not, I'm not one of these rigid people that says, you know, when you and I are having coffee, oh my word, it's 512. I need to get on the road because it takes me eight minutes to get home and I'm going to start cleaning my oven at exactly 530. I'm not one of those, (laughs) those structured people with time as much. I mean, when I need to get things done, I am, but we're a little more loosey goosey with just our relationships and our, you know, how things go around the house. But as far as how things look, we're, we both like things kind of neat. Although you would laugh right now, Gwen, if you saw my house. Cause we, just, <laughs> we just in the past six weeks moved to a new house. Then I had four speaking engagements where I had to get on an airplane and go. And then there were three Christmases, three different extended family Christmases. My son got married five states away in Georgia. And during all of that, my father who is 87 years old, fell and 23 days later died in a hospice. All of that happened in six weeks. So my house right now, I still haven't even unpacked, even though we moved in six weeks, almost seven weeks ago now. It's just crazy messy. But usually... I like things neat. Oh my gosh. I I just, I just function better. I don't know. I'm just one of these weird people. I can't sit and have my, my time with the Lord in the morning with my Bible open on my couch and my cup of coffee there. If I can see dirty dishes on my counter, I gotta go do the dishes first. Sorry, (laughs) Jesus. You're going to have to wait just a second. (laughs) Uh, I understand that, but I'm thinking of your past six or seven weeks. And that is like, it caused me to, to hold my breath while you were explaining that. So Mm -hmm. I know that, you know, you're even speaking from a place of, 
I need the structure. I need the order. And yet I'm not there yet. And I think that even as our listeners are, are, are hearing this conversation, someone's going to be encouraged by that because as well, much as we love order yes. and, and things to look beautiful, there are times when things are just out of whack. And, right, right. and I love the word that, you know, you're describing, you know, you, you got to have the flexibility. And that's what you're saying that you have with, with you and Todd, it, you know, when it comes to time, when it comes to, you're flexible. You have, you know, you, you'll, right. you know, zig and zag as, as needed. And I think that's really right. important, especially when it comes to marriage, especially with any relationships. And I think that today we are going to be talking about marriage specifically, but if you're listening and you're not married, I bet you know someone who, who is. <laughs> and, and honestly, a lot of what Karen, I think a lot of what you share in the book would translate to other relationships and friendship as well. So I'd like to, to even talk about that in consideration of the fact that, you know, not all of us are married. Some of us used to be married. You know, there's so many different layers of where we are in life. And so as much as we're talking about marriage today, it's going to apply to every single one of us in terms of the conversation. And one of the things in your book that definitely applies to every single one of us is <laughs> you talk about becoming a faithful forgiver. So what is a faithful forgiver? And and you said that not only do we have to become faithful forgivers, but we have to be faithful forgivers who also forget. Mm -hmm. What do you mean by that? Well, you know, I don't know if anyone else can relate to this or not, but I have this this terrible tendency in my marriage and in a lot of my other relationships too, Gwen, to get historical. And I don't mean hysterical, where I'm like flying off the handle. Well, sometimes I do that too. I was going to say, yeah, well, I actually do that sometimes. <laughs> but I get historical and I can so easily dredge up the past. And when my husband and I are interacting about one certain issue I think the conversation is about actually I start to go back in the past and I bring up things and say, and that time you said this or in the time, this is just so typical. It's just like the time when you, and I, I get historical. Mm. And so when I talk in the book about being a faithful forgiver who also forgets, that's what I'm talking about. That when we go to God with our trials with our spouse. We talk with each other. Honestly, we own up to the things that we've said or done that are wrong. We say, will you please forgive me? Our spouse does the same and says, will you please forgive me? And we have granted each other that forgiveness. We need to then close that book and not put it on a shelf where we're going to reopen it again. We like, you know, go burn the book <laughs> like it's over and done with and forget it. You know, that's how God deals with us. Yeah. Like when I go to him with something I've done wrong, some sin I've committed, and I earnestly say, I'm so sorry, will you forgive me? He does. He doesn't look at me and, you know, a year or a month or a day later when I do something similar, go, um, you know what, this is just like the last time. No, he, it says as far as the East is from the West, so far has he removed our sins from us. Like he doesn't remember them. So why do we not take a cue from him and treat other people in our lives the same way. Why do we keep bringing it up? We need to stop doing that. We need to stop doing that. And I'm preaching to myself there because yeah. like I said, that's, that's my favorite weapon is to get historical and I'm very good at it. I'm very good at it because <laughs> I have a great memory. I'm, I have a great memory. I'm telling you, Gwen, I can tell you what my husband said or did that hurt my feelings. And I can tell you where he was standing and what shirt he had on. I mean, that's how good my memory is. And he doesn't have such a great memory. So when we get into a fight and we start dredging up the past, like I always win because he can't remember anything. Well, I can't remember what I went upstairs for, but it is amazing <laughs> how the long term, because it's almost like pain sears a place in our hearts and in our minds that we can just easily recall. I know that I can as well. So what do you say to the woman who whose husband is constantly hurting her or just being inconsiderate or she feels hurt by things. So, or so she says, I don't know how to forget. I don't know how, how do you get there? Well, that's such a loaded question because there's so many different situations. There's so many different levels of yeah. hurt. And, and I certainly, and, and I say this right at the beginning of the book, I certainly wrote this book for the average person in an average marriage that has the average bumps in the road and frustrations, there are certainly times when people need to seek help because what's happening is not normal. Yeah. It's, 
it is abusive. It is either emotionally or physically or spiritually abusive. And that's not the person I'm talking to. I want that person to like not even buy the book and just go get, go get help, seek out help with a pastor, a trained Christian counselor. Um, But for those of us that just experienced those normal bumps in the road, those normal hurts, maybe some of us are experiencing them more often because we do have a spouse that's maybe more harsh. Um, My husband tends to be more on the passive side than the aggressive side. I know some women are married to a man who's the opposite, and it's going to look different for everyone. But I think I lay out some some tools to help people attack the problem without attacking attacking the person. Mm. And that's just, it's complicated because when a situation happens, there's the surface of what's happening, but then there's also sometimes, you know, the issue's not really the issue. It's something else is going on. And so I think having honest conversations where you talk about the perception of, you know, this is what I heard you say. Is this what you meant? Because sometimes we assign a motive that's not really there. Yes. And then that's where we get hurt. Yes. Like, for, I'll give an example. So one time my husband was coming home from work and he very sweetly texted and said, is there anything you need? And I said, yeah, I'm out of ha- a half and half. Because I like my coffee. Girl. And so, yeah. <laughs> Amen. I, I, so we're having Fritos and coffee? Is no, no. We're going to have such a party. It's going to be a party. That's right. <laughs> so he comes home. He waltzes in the house. He sets the creamer down on the counter. And I say, thank you. And I walk over. And it's fat free. Oh, that's the worst. That is well, the not worst. only the taste, but, you know, I'm thinking, okay, I'm a little chunky here. <laughs> and he got me fat free creamer. Is he saying he wishes I were more fat free? Oh, no. I mean, so I assigned a motive to him that wasn't even there. The man does not shop for half and half. He walked to the dairy case. He saw the big letters that said half and half. He didn't look at the little, little letters that said fat free and it tastes horrible. He just grabbed it. And so like, I had my nose out of joint a little bit that day thinking, is this a subtle message he's trying to send me, you know, and so I assigned a motive that wasn't even there. So that's a really silly example. But sometimes we do that. When I remember my husband not introducing me to somebody we ran into up at Walmart. I think that people in the South say the Walmart. My, <laughs> yes, the Walmart. You say it, at Walmart. And someone my husband worked with, and he sat and probably had a three to five minute conversation with this man. And he never introduced me, never introduced me. And I walked away and I thought, is he embarrassed by what I look like? Is he embarrassed that I'm his wife? Does he not even love me and wish he, is, he never married me? Like my mind went all these places and I assigned a motive to him that was not there. When I said something and I wish I could say, I sweetly said, Hey, can you help me to understand something? <laughs> but I'm like, you don't love me. You think I'm not as pretty as the other ladies that were, but you know what happened? He couldn't remember the guy's name. Yeah, yeah. And he was embarrassed and he didn't want to say, this is my wife, Karen. What's your name again? Because the guy worked like three stations down from him or something. So again, I think we need to just dial things back, calm down and say, hey, when this happened, this is what I heard or this is what I saw. This is how I felt. Is that what you meant? And sometimes that right there can diffuse a fight before it even breaks out. Yeah. Hey guys, I've got an exciting announcement. I host a five-part online Bible study called The Psalm Adventure. I've had tons of questions and conversations and I've gotten so many emails and messages asking me how you can know what God says about forgiveness and healing and fear and depression and finances and relationships and hope. You want to know how to connect your personal struggles to the promises of God and you want to know what His heart for you is. And that's exactly what we explore in our psalm adventure because we're going right to the source of all grace and all truth. We're going to the Bible. So I invite you to join me for my next live psalm adventure. Each week we meet for live sessions online. We seek God's heart together and grow as a Graceology community. Even if you've never done a Bible study before in your life, I promise you this psalm adventure is doable and will really help connect your needs to God's provision and your questions to God's answers. So join me and allow the Lord to restore your strength and your peace, heart, mind, and soul. Learn more about the study and register today by visiting gwensmith.net slash psalmadventure. That's gwensmith.net slash psalmadventure.
I think it's really important what you said that we don't assign motives to other people because that's, oh, that, that is the dangerous, that's dangerous territory to walk for any of us. We are not that person. We cannot know that. And yet we do it. Why do we do that? I think we always want to be right. This is how my brain goes. I want to be right. So I want to say, I know what happened. I know how it went down Mm. and I get easily offended and I pick a fight because you know what? I'm just going to be honest. I like a good fight. (laughs) I like to argue. I really think I missed my calling. I could have been a lawyer. I love to argue. Yeah. But it's so funny, not only with my family, like I would never argue with you. I'd be seen as to be. It's this very strange, like it doesn't fit in any of the personality types, Enneagrams, anything. I was going to say, what is your Enneagram number? I am a three wing two. So I'm a achiever with the wing of a helper. Yeah, that's cool. What's, um, what about Todd? Uh, he is a straight up nine peacemaker. He oh. never ruffles anybody, anybody's feathers at all. Very nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're going to so laugh any- at this. You, you know, Brad and I are going to need your book because I'm an eight wing seven, strong seven, but I'm an okay. eight seven and he is, <laughs> he is an eight two. You have two eights married to each other? Well, not only that, Karen, but my oldest son is an eight seven. My, my middle son is a two eight. And then Kennedy is a three two. Oh my gracious. Yeah. We have all five of us with the dominant leader personalities or our household. Is I would love to, I would love to <laughs> be a fly on the wall and see a fight at your house. Well, yeah, I was going to say we can fight, uh, but it's yeah. so funny because when Brad and I were first married, we had gone, uh, we're, we're talking, you know, we've been married a long time, but when we lived in Ohio, we went to this Gary Smalley uh, marriage conference mm-hmm. when we were first married. And Gary Smalley used to do the personality test with animals in quad. Yes. Remember that? So yes. if you were the I was dominant. An otter. Yeah. Okay. Well, I was a, a split lion otter. Exact. Okay. But lion okay. was the first, just like Enneagrams 8 7. It's almost the same thing. So in Brad, when we took the test, he was a lion beaver. And, and literally, Gary Smalley got up and there were, we were at the chapel in Akron, which was our church back in the day when we lived in Ohio. And there were, 2000 people at this marriage conference. So a thousand couples and Gary Smalley, after we took the test, he got, he stood up and he said, okay, now I know that a lot of times, you know, you have very different results, but is there anyone here, any couples who have both of you have the first animal lion? We want you to stand up. And there was about literally about nine or 10 of us who, couples wow. who stood up out of a thousand and including <laughs> the head pastor at the time, Newt Larson and his wife, Janine. And so the head pastor and his wife and then uh, off on the side in a wing here's this young little 20 something couple standing up and it was brad and i and gary smiley looked at like the 10 or let's say there was 10 couples standing up and he goes good luck i don't know what y'all are gonna do (laughs) and and boy it can be it can be a bunch of fireworks so in you know when you have a little sassy pants like me and girls who like you who like to fight how do you practically attack the problem without attacking the person you got to try to remove your emotions from things and just keep to the facts. And that's very hard when you're an emotional person. Yes. You know, when you when you are assigning motives. And one thing I wanted to say about assigning motives, we have this fabulous principle at Proverbs 31 Ministries, the ministry for which I speak. Mm -hmm. And it's this it is believe the best, don't assume the worst. And so I've learned to do that in my work life at Proverbs, but I've carried that over into my family, like believe the best, don't assume the worst. But our brain just jumps right to assuming the worst. And if the tables were turned and someone is thinking about us, we don't want, we don't want them to, you know, just believe the, or assume the worst about us that we have bad motives. We want others to give us the benefit of the doubt. So we need to give our spouses, whoever we're dealing with the benefit of the doubt and then remove the emotions. Let's just talk facts. This is what happened. This is what happened. Okay. Now, now let's talk feelings. Okay. So when that happened, this is how I felt. This is what it did to me. But we just, we skip the facts and we jump right to feelings because we're hurt or we're angry or Whatever emotion is, you know, coming out of, of us rises to the top and we just start talking in an emotional way rather than, and so then we do start attacking the person rather than attacking the problem. And if we both believe in our marriage and we, we want to stay together and we want to have a good marriage with great communication and with lots of love and forgiveness and wiping the slate clean and hitting that restart button over and over again, if that is our goal, then it's, it's going to be hard. It's going to be rough. It's going to take a while to get in this groove. But if we can make it our goal to just stop, talk about the facts, 
then talk about our feelings about the facts, and then talk about any forgiveness that needs to happen, and then take it one step further. How can we do this differently in the future? Mm -hmm. Like, what can we do so we don't, my my husband and I call it file 13. So we don't keep pulling out file 13 and going, (laughs) oh, here we go again. You know, we want to deal with it so that when it happens again, because inevitably it will, because you, you still got the same personality types talking to each other and interacting with each other. You still got the same life where there might be that issue rises again. Maybe it's a parenting issue if you're married and have children and it's something with one of your teens. I I can think, and I won't give examples, but I can think of things with when our children were teens. Um, They're all adults now. Our last one's about ready to turn 21. But when they were teenagers and there were things that happened, you know, my husband liked to be one way and I liked to be another way. And yeah, so yeah. say it's file of 13, because I like to step in and prevent bad behavior mm. by, lect- by lecturing, screaming and throwing the Bible in there. I like to step <laughs> in and prevent. And my husband likes to step back and let them make their own choices and live with the consequences and let them decide on their own not to do that again, because they learned the hard way where I want them to just not do it in the first place. Yeah. You know, so that always caught, that was our file 13. Yeah, that's <laughs> good. <laughs> what? But you know what, Gwen? See, this is where I love how God uses two different people to accomplish what he's trying to accomplish, especially in family life. Because now that our kids are adults and we sit around and we talk about these things, there are so many times that they say, mom, you know, when such and such happened, all you cared about were the church ladies. Like, what are the church ladies going to think about this? You know, mm. whatever that kid did, because I'm such a people pleaser. And mm. how does this look to everybody? And my husband, like, he didn't care about their outward behavior. He cared about their heart. Mm. And he would often tell them, you know, what's going on in your life that caused you to, to make this choice? And he really wanted to kind of get into their heart and their thoughts and why they did it. And I'm like, just stop the doing, just stop doing it, you know? Yeah. And so now as adults, they're like, We're so grateful that we had both of you because, yeah, there were times that mom's lectures did save us some hurt and we did listen to her and we didn't do something. We're so glad we didn't. But more often than not, they needed to make a choice that was stupid because I I always say once my kids get to be adults, I'm going to write a book called The Stupid Years, you know, because (laughs) I call it the same thing. (laughs) So um, but there were a lot of times they can look back and say, you know, but dad cared more about our heart. He just let us go ahead and go down that road and learn the lesson the hard way. And guess what? We learned it. We, we owned it. We didn't do it again, Yeah. but maybe, I don't know. I see a lot and I'm not trying to point fingers at all, but I see a lot of, of parents who really, really ultra shelter and control their kids when they're teenagers. So there won't be even a possibility of a bad choice. Yeah. Yeah. And then later when they get out on their own or maybe even out of college, they rebel Big time. You know, if my kids are going to rebel, I want them to do it when they're in my house, you know? Yeah. Um, and not, we, we never had any major rebellion, just little bitty things that I'm like, oh, you should have done that, you know? But um, that was our file 13. Yeah. And I know people probably can think of their own in their relationship, whether it's a marriage relationship or a coworker, a best friend, a parent, whatever, that uh, you keep revisiting that. You keep bumping up against it over and over again because you've never really learned how to attack the problem. You're just attacking the person or maybe you're a stuffer and you're ignoring the person Mm. because you don't want to deal with it. But if we can learn to talk about the facts, talk about our feelings, do any kind of I'm sorry, will you forgive me that that needs to happen and then think, okay, how can we do this differently? I think you'll see progress. Yeah, I think that's really good. And what you're really saying is we have to be intentional. These are disciplines. There are disciplines, like you said, when instead of attacking the person, we want to attack the problem. So I think that's really great. It's it's stop yourself, remove the emotions and go with the facts, then bring in your feelings as a discussion point, I felt. And then, you know, that whole talk about the next time thing, that's really being intentional, Karen. And I think that's so key. One of the disciplines that I have begun to impart with with my teenagers and with my kids has been is is just when we frustrate frustrate each other and with Brad too it's it's backing out and saying we're both frustrated but I want you to understand the big picture is I want God's best for you and I love you 
Mm-hmm. And I even allow that to just soften my own heart by speaking it. And theirs on the receiving end, I've learned that just, but it reminds me, <laughs> I don't have to engage in, in a major battle. I can back out and gain bigger perspective and then head back in. Yeah, that's really good. It's almost like I a dance that. step, you know? Mm-hmm. Oh, there's just so many, so many complications. And I know that one of the complications that you write about in your book as well is the beautiful, <laughs> the beautiful mess of social media and the comparison traps that we get drawn into. So can you tell us a little bit about that? Social media has just added a whole new layer to this uh, looking at other people and thinking they have a better life than you because we just see all of these images of romantic dinners or couples enjoying each other's company when, you know, we're not there. Yeah. <laughs> we're kind of, you know, we're doing the opposite. We're eating leftovers and we're wishing we weren't with our spouse right now because they're driving us crazy or they're, they've made us angry or whatever. But I think we need to just really think about the part that social media can play in our discontentment in marriages because we compare ourselves to what we see on the screen. We compare our marriages to what we see on the screen and all of this comparing leaves us coming up short. So I've actually encouraged people not to unfollow someone, you know, in particular, like on Instagram, but you can hide them. So yes. you don't see their stuff. If it's really messing with you, maybe you need to hide their stuff. So it isn't constantly flashing across your, you know, in front of your eyes all day long, if it leads you to a place of discontentment and even log off for a while and just go get your Bible, yes. look at your Bible for a while. <laughs> you know, and I'm not saying social media is bad. I, I, this is what I like to think about social media. Is this a tool, a toy or a tangent? Mm. If it's a tool that can help you connect with people and keep up with their lives, you know how to pray. That's great. If it's a toy, that's even fine. You know, go play your games on your phone. Don't ask me to play them because those kind of things stress me out. But even (laughs) it being a toy is fine. But it's when it goes from being a tool or a toy to being a tangent and it it gets us off course in life. It either sucks our time. Hello, Pinterest. And me just me just moving to a new house. I could be on Pinterest all day long looking for ideas for decorating. But even I don't I don't even mean a tangent that way where it just takes our time, but it gets us off course in our life with the Lord because he's trying to teach us one thing, but we're seeing this stuff on social media and then it's taking up our time and it's it's kind of messing with our thoughts and we're not aligning our thoughts with with God's thoughts because we're so just entrapped by what we see on social media and it makes us have this longing to be like other people rather than a longing to be like Jesus. And yes. it's a very dangerous place. It's a very dangerous place. Yes. Well, I mean, it, it, it all makes sense. There's no question about it. So with your book, Keep Showing Up, obviously the goal is for each of us to to thrive in marriage and to love our spouses well. And that's going to start in our own hearts. So can you get practical with me as we wrap up our conversation? conversation and offer any suggestions to our Graceology community about what listeners can do today, this week to to show love to their spouses. Give me some, give me a toolbox here. I think it's really the conversations we have with ourselves mm. <laughs> in our own minds that, you know, we've got bought into this notion that, you know, marriage is this just romantic butterflies and harps playing uh, ushy gushy feeling of love all the time. And it's that you complete me, you find that soulmate. And, and when we think about marriage in that way, and then we look at our reality, that's where we start having these conversations in our mind that mm. like, Oh, I mar- I must've married the wrong person. Or, yes. you know, I didn't, I was, I was young. I didn't know what I was doing. I don't love them anymore. But instead of looking at marriage as two halves that come together to make a whole, we need to look at marriage more as two whole people becoming more holy, becoming Mm. more like Jesus. Because you know what? This is what I firmly believe, Gwen, that your marriage is a message and people are watching you preach. What are they seeing? What are they seeing? Are they seeing, you know, because marriage was not designed to make us happy. Marriage was not designed for two half people to suddenly become whole. No, you're a whole person, whether you're married or not. But marriage was designed to display the gospel to the watching world. So people will look at our marriage and see us loving unconditionally, forgiving repeatedly, wiping the slate clean, and having that redemption happen where our marriage does get a new fresh start if we just keep showing up and keep doing the hard work because you know marriage is hard work and it's not about you it's about 
God. And when we can get our perspective right and quit looking to our marriages to make us happy, then I think it, it makes it, it's not, I don't want to say it's easier, but it does empower you to keep doing the hard work because we get our perspective all wrong and we start treating our spouse like they're a God. And I don't mean that we worship them, but we expect them to give to us what only God can give. Yes. You know, only God can give me joy. Only God knows that everything I'm thinking. Only God understands me. Only God is perfect. But we expect our spouse to be like that. And I remember my friend Lisa telling me something once that I've never forgotten, that even the very best spouse makes a very poor God. Yeah. Don't make your spouse your God. Don't make your marriage about you and making you happy. Make your marriage about you continuing to show up, forgive, forget, do things differently in the future and keep going forward so people can watch your marriage and see a glimpse of the gospel because they see you offering love and redemption and they get this picture that they wouldn't get anyplace else. Wow. Well, Karen, you've definitely got me thinking about different internal dialogues that I can have with myself and about the truth of the fact that my marriage is a message and it's and it's it's a sermon to the world and to those who don't know the Lord. And I know that our listeners out there have been encouraged today as well. I'm so thankful that you joined us. So the book is Keep Showing Up, How to Stay Crazy in Love When Your Love Drives You Crazy. <laughs> Karen Eman, thank you so much for being on the Graceology podcast. Thanks for having me, Gwen. It's my pleasure. Such a great and important conversation for us to have today. Be sure to visit Karen Eman online and definitely connect with her on social media as well. Today's show was edited by Chad Shooping and the music is by premiumbeat.com. If you have any questions, comments, or topic suggestions, I would love to hear from you. Hit me with a DM on Instagram. I'm at Gwen Smith Music. All of the links and show notes from today's episode can be found at gwensmith.net slash graceology. That's Gwen smith.net slash graceology. Thanks for joining me today. I'll be back with another episode soon. Until then, if you haven't already subscribed, please head over to iTunes and subscribe to the Graceology with Gwen Smith podcast. Subscriptions and reviews on iTunes make a huge impact for those of us who are working hard to bring you these shows. Also, go find me on social media. I love connecting with you. I'm at Gwen Smith Music on every platform. Now get out there and have a beautiful, grace-filled day.